Hey there, welcome to LSAT Demon Daily. I'm Eric Johansson, a teacher with LSAT Demon. With me is Nathan Fox, one of the co-founders of LSATdemon.com and the weekly podcast, Thinking LSAT. Nathan, we got an email from Anonymous who recalls your 100% rule, sometimes the sure. called, I think, the 2x rule for law yep. school admissions on yep. st- some recommendation on how to assess rankings between different schools. Maybe you want to recap what the 100% rule is. Sure. Uh, it's just that if we see schools that are 100% or more separated from each other in the U.S. news rankings, then we determine that there is a real difference between those schools. So, for example, you know, Yale at number one versus um, Michigan at number 10 or whatever they are. That's way more than uh, twice Yale's ranking. And so we determine that there is a difference between those schools. Uh, on the other hand, if we're comparing schools that are ranked, say, 20 to 30, we would say, well, twice 20 is 40. So really, there's not a significant difference between schools in those ranges. Especially when you look at how those numbers fluctuate from year to year, pretty wild swings. Oh, that's insane. Yeah. If you and we have a tool where you can visualize the the tracking of the um rankings over time. And I'm not sure is that LSAT demon.com forward slash rankings. I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. So you can really visualize how much the rankings change over time. This is uh LSAT demon.com forward slash rankings. And you can look at either the U S news rankings. Um, you know, when you scroll down a little bit, you just start to see that hover over any school, you know, here's uh just randomly university of Alabama. It's been as low as I mean, as high as 21 and as low as 38. Um, Interesting that it doesn't itself have an internal 100% difference, you know, variance. Hmm. So that's still Alabama. There are other schools, though. You know, there are there are schools that have moved. Yeah, I'm I'm just picking you know at random, like Wake Forest University. They were as high as 47, or as low, I guess, as 47, and as high as 22. So there's a school that has moved by more than 100%. Our, Our are it's a real rough rule of thumb but it's like if you're comparing number 14 to number 18 there's just not a significant difference if you're comparing number 14 to number 30 then there's a hundred percent difference between those schools there might be a difference between those schools in actual fact and i i don't want people to like take this as gospel and you know there's absolutely never any difference between the school that's ranked 10th and the school that's ranked 19th or something because you know, that's close and there might be a difference and you got to take it on a case by case basis, but just rough rule of thumb. If it's not a hundred percent or more, there's probably not a huge significant difference between those two schools. Yeah. Well, I think it can be useful maybe in helping anonymous. So anonymous asks, I'm trying to decide between Drexel and temple Drexel's ranking is 80 temple is 54. I have a $120,000 merit scholarship with a 2.0 conditional GPA from Drexel. So as long as you remain in good academic standing at Drexel, 120,000, I believe that would be for the, yeah, over the course of three years. Um, And no scholarship from Temple. I mean, right off the bat, the decision seems pretty clear to me between these two options. Yeah, but we do have the ability to compare these two together directly on this tool. So lsatdemon.com forward slash rankings. You can click the little uh, the, the, the icon that's got the sliders, I guess. And then you can just go, I'm going to type in Drexel. Great. And I'm going to type in Temple. Great. Yeah, so you're looking at Temple, which has gone from a low of 72 to a high of 47, but then back to a 54, currently 54, at least last time we updated this tool. Uh, Drexel, on the other hand, yeah, they were not ranked at all. They were 101 plus prior to, what, seven years ago. They've gotten as high as 78, and they're now ranked 80th. So these two schools... Right now, they fail the 100% rule. Have they ever met the 100% rule? Uh, close, close. I mean, when, you know, when uh, when Temple was 48th. Oh, yeah, well, down here for sure, Drexel was 100th. So 
they were, you know, four years ago, it did. But th that's why we have to not take this 100% rule so seriously, because it, they're going to wildly fluctuate. So, you know, but yeah. this, I think, you know, looking at the, the range of fluctuation over time gives you a much better picture of what the rankings actually mean. Mm -hmm. When they say, you know, you know how uh, LSAC on their score reports, when you take the LSAT and you get a 170, they then, sh well, that's not really a 170. There's this band and they say, well, it's a 167 to a 173 is what that really means. They're trying to help you understand that there might be some noise in the data. There's a lot of noise in the U.S. news rankings data. So Temple has been all over the place and Drexel has also been all over the place. 101 plus, they just don't even rank those schools. But now all of a sudden, you know, it's been ranked in the top 100 for a few years. And you just got to understand that, you know, we, we can't predict. I can't predict the stock market. I can't predict this stuff either. So I have no idea which direction these things are going in next year or especially five years from now. And nobody who goes to law school is going to be practicing law anytime in the next like five years, really. Right. You're going to. Yeah. You're applying now. It's going to take a while to go. Once you go, it's three years of school. Then you got to study for the bar. And so, yeah, it's like trying to forecast five years in the future on this chart. Uh, pretty, pretty tough. It is. Yeah. Imagine going to picking a school because it's ranked 40th instead of 60th. And then three years later, when you graduate, those could easily be swapped. I mean, it could be swapped next year. Yeah. And then the above the law rankings are also funny because Temple was ranked 51 or higher, which is unranked for the above the law rankings. Then it was all the way up to a high of 28. Then it was back down to 51 plus, which apparently it still is. Then meanwhile, Drexel has gone from they were 51 plus mostly, and then they spiked up to 37, down to 50, back to 51 plus. Who knows what's really going on here? Yeah. Anyways, getting back to Anonymous, Anonymous yeah, yeah. is comparing these offers. So uh, 120K uh, scholarship from Drexel, no scholarship from Temple. Continues, both are well ranked in the practice area I'm interested in, which is health law compliance. I have a background in marketing, so law would be a second career, and would love to work in a pharmaceutical company's legal department. Temple is ranked 17th in health law and Drexel is 26th. What do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, I I don't know. I, I hate to break it to you, but those practice area rankings are just garbage. Like the fact that Temple is ranked seventeenth in health law, I don't care what Harvard, Stanford, you know, they might not be even ranked in health law. I'm sure they are, but any school that vastly outranks Temple in the U.S. news rankings is going to be better at health law. Like if you're trying to get a job in health law, if you're coming from Harvard. Nobody gives a shit what Harvard's health law ranking is. And comparing, yeah, I don't, who knows what that even means? 17th in health law and Drexel's 26th? I, I don't know. I think that that's almost meaningless, really. So probably I, I, I would I don't think that's really a factor. Anonymous continues. Do you think that pharmaceutical companies are more likely to hire someone from Temple than Drexel? That's the main reason I'd consider Temple over Drexel. Locally, Temple has a strong reputation in Philadelphia. Drexel's Law School is newer, started in 2016. My, are pharmaceutical companies based in Philly? I don't know. I mean, you acknowledge that these are regional schools, seem like fine regional schools with a local reputation. Are the pharmaceutical companies that you want to work for there in Philly, or are they elsewhere where maybe the hiring managers have never worked with anybody from either school i ultimately i don't think either nate or i know what's on the mind of hiring managers at pharmaceutical companies legal departments but yeah i, I don't know i have no idea I, I you'd have to talk to people who work at pharmaceutical companies i mean you got to start making phone calls and talk to actual lawyers who have the kind of job that you want it sounds far-fetched honestly like you're, you have a background in marketing. Do you have connections to pharmaceutical companies, legal departments? Cause then otherwise it's completely unrelated. And it just kind of sounds like a fantasy to me that I'm going to go to a, a school that's ranked 17th in health law. And then that's going to give me a, uh, like, I'm going to go into, go in house at a pharmaceutical company. Um, <laughs> 
you're going to have to like practice pharmaceutical companies are huge companies. I would imagine that the way to get into that work is to either have a technical background. I think that that could help a lot. Like, you know, you studied biochem and then went to law school. I think that's a much shorter route. Yeah, I think I think anonymous you should get on LinkedIn. Stalk some people who sure. have these jobs and send out some messages, polite messages saying, hey, can you, well, first off, see what their background is, where they went. And then that's what I was going to say. Yeah. yeah. I, not only their their background in terms of where they went, but their background in terms of um, what kind of undergraduate experience does it, does it look like they have biochem experience? Yeah. Because that's what I mean, I, I would it seems like it would be almost necessary to practice in these areas. I don't see how you're practicing in these areas without a technical background. I could be totally wrong. You might see that there's people there who look just like you. Maybe there's people you, you're on LinkedIn, you're looking at the at the legal department for Pfizer or whatever, and you see people who have. They are in the pharmaceutical, they're in Pfizer's legal department, they have. A background in marketing, you know, and no scientific background. Oh, and by the way, they went to Temple or a similarly ranked school or, you know, a worse ranked school than Temple and they got that job. Then I would be much more willing to believe in this plan. But if you look at people on LinkedIn who work in the in-house at these companies and you see that they, all of them went to Harvard, Stanford, Yale, or all of them have biochem bachelors, then I, I just, this seems really far-fetched yeah i hope i'm wrong for you anonymous i mean i i'm not trying to crush your dream it just seems i know nothing about pharmaceutical law nor the people who practice it so yeah do your research um there's another I thing don't, i just well and 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 maybe maybe anonymous doesn't realize this but like almost no one goes directly from law school to in-house right uh, that's that's gonna be extremely rare i mean at that I, I would say that probably only happens if you have a specific technical background. If you coming from a marketing background, I just don't see how you go straight into a pharmaceutical legal department. So you're looking at like the next job down the road instead of realizing that there's going to be intermediate jobs to even get you there. And that's probably going to be big law, like big, big law firms. Is that what you want to do <laughs> is work in big law for a little while so that you can hopefully go in house at a company because like law school graduates don't know how to practice law and there's no way that pharmaceutical companies are hiring people who don't know how to practice law anonymous throws out uh rutgers as another option um a couple things i think in the rest of anonymous email that stick out one saying that another plus for drexel would be the ability to do a two-year accelerated JD program so that their legal career will begin sooner. They also mention that they're 54 years old and acknowledges, I, I says, Anonymous says, um, I know you would normally say take the LSAT again, but taking that aside, which would you pick given these options? It just, it reads to me like Anonymous is feels like they're in a hurry because of their age. They're thinking about an accelerated JD program. They're acknowledging that they should probably take the LSAT again, but are asking if I didn't, which one of these would I pick? And that is a dangerous road. Think anonymous. You, you realize these aren't your best offers. You could better situate yourself by not getting so caught up in the rush. And getting a better LSAT score. Yeah. What difference does it make if you start practicing law when you're 57 or 58 how, or 59? How, how different that's you're the same person. I mean, we change probably less when we get older. <laughs> so I don't, I don't see how it matters really very much. And as far as an investment is concerned, um, you know, I know you're saying Rutgers would only cost 24,000 total it looks like you said that uh, Drexel would cost 40,000 total. Temple would cost 90,000 total. Only 24 for Rutgers, but that's a lot of money. I mean, are you, you going to pay cash for that? Are you going to write a check for that? Or are you going to write a check for the 40 for Drexel or the 90K for Temple? And if it's not going to bother you at all to write that check, like you had a successful career and 
you've been squirreling it away and you've got disposable cash to pay for something like this, then yeah. But if you really like need this, you know, if you're going to need the income as a lawyer so that you can repay loans that you're going to take out here, mm. I just think, you know, this seems like a long shot to me and I would not be um, making that wager unless, you know, hopefully you have specific connections that are going to help you get this job. But if you don't have those specific connections, I don't, you're not a shoe in, even at the best of these schools, you are not even close to a shoe in for like automatically <laughs> getting an in-house job at a pharmaceutical yeah. company. I mean, even if you went to Harvard, I don't think you're, you're a shoe in for a in-house job at a pharmaceutical company. There's a lot so of I hope money. You got the connections. There's a lot of money on the line in pharmaceuticals. Yeah, I think they're going to hire like I can absolutely see them taking a third year associate who went to, you know, who practiced big law, maybe, you know, uh, probably from a firm that the pharmaceutical company empl uh, employed. And so now they actually have experience working with you. And then they make you an offer where you can jump ship and go work in house. But I would think a couple, three years is like the minimum. You know who the bio, uh, who the um, pharmaceutical companies want? Because they want that that guy who wrote in to the show the other day with the 3.9 from Yale in a biochemistry major. Yeah, I don't see how they're going to be interested in marketing. I, I, don't, I just don't need, know that that's a, yeah. a skill that really translates into the legal department, especially at a pharmaceutical company. Yeah. I mean, I understand that they, pharmaceutical companies have a lot more legal matters in front of them besides just biotech issues, right? It's not like every issue is an intellectual property issue. Mm -hmm. They have normal, you know, they have customers that you know, like didn't get their shipment and it's going to be like a real normal kind of a legal matter, the normal contract stuff, employee stuff. But because Anonymous is specifically asking about working in a pharmaceutical company, well, what, what makes you special for the pharmaceutical company? And it ain't going to be my school was ranked 17th in health law. That's not going to impress, I don't think, anybody at all. Best of luck, Anonymous. Uh, do stay in touch if you do this research on LinkedIn, connect with people, find out more about what it takes. Let us know. We'd love to learn more. Yeah, I hope I'm wrong. Uh, email daily at lsatdemon.com and let us know. Everybody else out there who's listening, if you want to ask us a question or share some LSAT or law school admissions news, again, it's daily at lsatdemon.com. Thanks for listening. Yeah.